was his first totally Hitchcock film in America, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, so let's talk about the script for, for a minute. In, in, in some senses, this is a typical script and it deals with that sense of, you know, danger and the lurking. And, and, and I think at its core, the film is about like, what could be happening in your family that you just don't really get to. But in many ways, it doesn't have the kind of external forces that a Hitchcock film would have doesn't have somebody, I mean, in the beginning he's sort of running away from the police, but it doesn't have like the police are after him and the mob is after him or all these other kind of, you know, intricate plotting that you would have in a typical Hitchcock film. And on the other hand, it was, you know, you had Thornton Wilder helping him and his wife helping him. I mean, it's in, in, so it's very Hitchcockian, yet not the kind of Hitchcockian film we would get a little bit later, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so what are some of your favorite scenes in the film? Well, the, I mean, the, the favorite scene has got to be the one sitting at the dinner table where he, <laughs> where uh, he's giving his uh, opinion on on women, you know, you know rich women. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's just so wonderful. And then that that last scene where he just she says they're alive and he just turns to the camera, are they? You know, that's just it's perfect. You know? and, and the close up on his face as yeah. he's saying, are they? Yes. Is just absolutely um, amazing. And, you know, I I d didn't remember that scene the first time through and, and you're totally not expecting it. And I mean, there he is, this character laying out why he does what he does and yeah it's it's a subtext of films you'll see later on from a lot of other people but to see him say it and the way he does and that performance that joseph cotton does yeah is really amazing you want to talk about about joseph cotton as 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 and sort of where this fits into his career well it was right after he finished working with wells i mean i, I think it was his first film after uh uh, what was what was his last film with Wells? It was uh, Emerson's. I think it was even. Uh, and what was the uh, what was the one where they were in Turkey? The uh, where Wells plays the, the police inspector. It was actually uh, directed by Norman Foster. The, I've got print of it around here somewhere. I can't Journey remember. into Fear, I think. Is what yeah, Journey into Fear. That's it. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know if it was before or after Journey into Fear, but uh, but but he'd been playing good guys. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you know, just kind of see your solid, basic good guy. Yeah, and 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 that's what that's what Hitchcock likes to make evil. You know, is is where you don't expect it. You know. Yeah. And and uh, I read something somewhere. I was looking through some stuff, and it was like. Uh, you know, he scared you in the shower. He scared you, you know, everywhere else. And now he's scaring you in your, your own home. family, you know. <laughs> at, at, he's making at, you scare to your family. At the dinner so, table, he's scared yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, which is, I think, you know, incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, what are some other scenes that, that um, are, uh, uh, that you found interesting? Um, well, there's a couple of camera shots that I really, I mean, some really nice camera shots. One is, when the detective drops off Teresa Wright at one point, she turns and there he is standing on the porch. It's just this very long shot and he's just staring at her, you know? Yeah. And then she takes that slow walk up to the porch and then at the last minute turns and goes around to the back, you know? And, uh, and then there's the, uh, right after Joseph Cotton thinks he's gotten away with it, you know, he's found out that the other guy's been killed. And so he's, you know, I'm going to eat a big dinner and all that. And he heads up the stairs and he stops at the top of the stairs and turns and look around, looks around. And she's standing at the bottom of the stairs staring at him, you know. And he knows now I haven't gotten away with it, you know, because of her. And the, the stairs are kind of a big deal. I mean, right, right. Well, you have the inside stairs and the outside. Well, Hitchcock, Hitchcock loves stairs. I mean, you know. Yeah. 
Nobody no. shoots stairs like like Hitchcock. Oh, yeah. does. Like a psycho. I mean, you know, the stairs and that was that was awesome. And it's and always notorious. that sense of like who's yeah. in control and who is being manipulated and the yeah. angles and looking mm -hmm. up and looking down. And it really gives you, you know, that sense of where you are in the world. And and, and it, it is, you know, as you said, you know, this is when we had more control. Like this is, I think, where like the major control freak of of Hitchcock comes in. Every last bit is so carefully um, storyboarded, every last detail. Mm -hmm. Every shot is like a visual film school. It's like you look at every shot and look at what's in the foreground, look at the background, look at where the shadow is, look at the foreshadow coming all the way across um, and look at the way the camera moves when she finds out in the library and it moves up and then you see your shadow coming there. It's like at every single place, you could take a look at every single shot and talk about how every one of those shots evokes exactly what Hitchcock is wanting you to see at any given moment and to feel. And I think that's, you know, what makes his films um, work so well is that, and I think um, this kind of way in which he's working, I mean, I think this is a film that sort of um, hits to it and, 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 and says that. Um, what other shots do you remember that you think work really well? Oh, I see. There's a, uh... Well, I, I, the it's interesting that, I mean, Char Charlie is, she is so sharp. I mean, this character is smart, you know. She's one of the smartest characters in, in any film, Hitchcock film I've seen. Yeah. Like, she picks up right when he gets off the train that, you know, he's faking this, that he's this sickly guy, but he, but he immediately takes his coat off, you know. But she's right. like, you look sick when you got off the train, you know. She just picks up on everything, you know. But and, she picks uh, up on it like really quickly, but it takes her a while until she's in the library to absolutely believe it. Right, right. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. Well, she didn't want to believe it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. she absolutely didn't want to believe it. Um, yeah. And then and then we have the the kids. I mean, the little girl with the glasses, mm -hmm. um, who is also like incredibly sharp, and and she she yeah. didn't want nothing from him. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I think from the get-go, she figured out this guy's bad news, and I ain't buying it. Yeah. Well, Hitchcock has he has this thing about women and glasses too. Yeah, I mean, like that friend of Charlie's, you know, that keeps yeah. showing up, you know. And yeah. it's just I'm not really sure because like he's done it in a lot of different films. Like in fact, he killed her in Sh in Strangers on a Train, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, but there's, and he had his daughter played that part in uh, uh, Psycho, you know, so. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's that's a thing for him. And, you know, who knows, that's an image of somebody um, he once knew with the glasses and yeah. he sort of um, held on to it. There's a lot of personal things in there too, like, you know, because, you know, Hitchcock's favorite novel when he was growing up was Ivanhoe. Mm -hmm. And so they mentioned that in the film, you know, and, and, uh, and then there's, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. The, uh, the, the, the way that he's portrayed the policeman in the film, who's like the friendliest guy in the world and like, uh, you know, stay on the curve and all that, you know, yet, you know, here's this murderer walk, walking around, you know, that, you know, it, he's just totally incompetent to figure that out, you know, but, uh, <laughs> But they're very nice, and they, they want to make oh, sure very you, nice. you very walk nice. very, very, very yeah. you know, nicely across the street. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they don't step on anybody's head and kill anybody. No, they don't. Right, right. None right. of that going on. Yeah, you can kill somebody, but stay on the curb, you know. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. So um, riddle me this. How do these two detectives, like, find Joseph Cotton, like, from Newark, New Jersey, to, they don't know what he looks like, right? And they just right. happen to like find him. You know, the thing about Hitchcock films is, if you try to go in and make everything make sense, it's just you would drive yourself crazy. It just doesn't work, you know. Because yeah. he's he's not worried about that, you know. He's he's uh, he wants the style of what he's 
doing to to show through and if he has to fudge a little bit here and there you know it's fine it, you know to me it's it's it was shocking you know that here this is a a detective who's this guy may be a, a you know a, a multiple murderer you know and yet the guy's niece he like befriends her and like almost immediately tells her well, yeah we're cops we're looking for your uncle you know yeah and, yeah uh, i mean that yeah, and, professional, you know. And how many people would believe it's like, hey, we're here, you you were picked, and we're doing a portrait of your right, family. right. We're taking pictures of you. Yeah. And they're like, Oh yeah, fine. That's really well, yeah. In nineteen forty-three it might have worked. I don't know. People are a little a little smarter now. So. Uh, but uh hang on, Mark's got a uh, comment. Okay. Well, what, what, one thing is there'd be a paper trail for his sister. I would I would think that's how they got how they caught him in, in Santa in, in California. And, and they were never yeah, it's really you know it's, to me to me I was less bothered by the detectives being there than I was the fact that they immediately you know because I mean how often does family you know cover up for a criminal you know and uh, well also I mean I. I wouldn't send my daughter nine nine years old or eighteen years old off with a couple of strange men. <laughs> well, it's nineteen forty three. I mean what, what's that probably in nineteen forty three? I think it'd be quite creepy any time. <laughs> I don't know. Um mm. so any other scenes you want to talk about, Jim? Oh gosh. Uh how did Thornton Wilder get involved in this? I think uh, I think because I, Hitchcock was so impressed with our town yeah. that he wanted to give some of that feel to this film, and I think that's kind of what he did, and that's probably was was his contribution, you know. And I also think that at this point, um, Hitchcock was not in America for a long time, and 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 this film had to feel Americana. It had to have the apple pie and that whole sort of sense. And I think that's what um, he brought to the table. Uh, you know, the, the Our Town universe, which I think is sort of the backdrop for what Santa Rosa sort of represents in, in any kind of way. So yeah, the town looks like a, a stage set from Our Town. I didn't yeah. know if it was pre-hour town or post-hour yeah. town, but I guess it's after. Yeah, some of the characters even sound like they're from New England. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what else? Anybody have any other questions about about the film? What what scenes did you like? What themes did you like? What is this? I, I have a question, if I may. Yes. Um, I I had a hard time with the concept that the Santa Rosa newspaper would have a story about this murder back east. I just didn't see that happening. I mean, I'm, you know, willing to suspend my disbelief and eat it because I love it. Mean, you have to with Hitchcock films, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I just thought that that probably wouldn't happen back then. Yeah. And, you know. and even if they did were able to pick it up as a wire, I mean, I guess they had wire services back yeah. then. But it wouldn't be on the front page. It's big, think. yeah. You know, it would be like in page, you know, twelve or something. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, well, you know, you know, journalism. If it bleeds, it leads. You know. So. Well, that is true. There's, there's that. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know that. But that is a major plot point. I mean, were it not for the newspaper, and if mm -hmm. Joseph Cotton didn't make such a big deal about the newspaper. And All right. Kind of let it go. Like none of the rest of the story would have played out in the same way. But, uh, they knew it was a national hunt. So yeah. I think that was part of why they had it in there. Also, I, I agree. It looked like a front page article, but the way they kept hunting around for it, I got the feeling it was inside. Although with the headline, the way it was, it seems it must've been on the first page, but that confused me too. I don't know. I think you might be right. I think you might be right about that. Because cause she did, when she went to the library, she went, she didn't see it right on the front page. She had to go through it in a couple of sections, I think. Right, right. Yeah. Well, he, he did, she made a point, he made a point when he was 
making the origami house out of the newspaper and yeah. she she noticed it was page like page five or something so yeah. she knew where to go to to look for it um mm -hmm. you know at least that at that point so lisa has this really interesting comment um i like the way they set up that charlie feels she and her uncle are the same person which takes a dark turn when she starts to suspect him. I feel like it's the reason she figured him out too, because there's a lot of similarity between them. So it's that sense of duality of good and bad, like living in the same person. And as a younger person trying to like figure out who she is, is she in touch with her own dark side? I think that's Lisa, what you're getting to, right? Like, like, and, and he maybe hints at that, but that doesn't really come out unless you really start thinking about that. I mean, she is Miss Goody Two Shoes, you know, she's knows the library well enough to know when they close. Um, and she knows how to walk down the street. So, you know, it, it, is this the sort of um, David Lynch, like there is an evil side to normalcy in the world and that she has that within her as well. I don't know. I I kind of disagree. I, I really didn't see that so much in the fact that it was just a, a relative she really admired and wanted to be more like as opposed to being like her parents. Yeah, and you know, it's like I think that, you know, when you have a relative that you don't see very much and is different than everybody you know, it's very easy to say, hey, that's the cool person. That's my cool Uncle Bob, you know? I only see him every once in a while, so what if he molested somebody? He's still well, my favorite told, uncle. What's that? But being told from her point of view and her being named after him, mm -hmm. I can yeah. see her totally wanting to to relate to him and find ways that that they are similar and sort of right. you know put that out out there. Yeah. I mean, throughout the throughout the movie, you kind of you kind of wonder is there like a psychic connection or uh, or, or, yeah. some, or something more than that. But in the end, I, I don't think. So. But I think if this film were remade now, I think Please. that would be the key to the film. Is like, does she see that darkness in herself? And yeah. does that mean that she like exposes him or doesn't expose him? Because yeah. I think that's how we would look at that situation now. She did at one point say, if you hurt my mother, I'm going to kill you myself. And that really surprised me yeah. coming from that character. Yeah. Well, there was a uh, I saw it. Uh, one at a time. Okay, Teresa, you go first. You're, you're from Brooklyn. You can go, you get the... Thank you. You had mentioned something, sir. You had mentioned something earlier about his shots and the shadows and you know the camera. In the in the scene with this gentleman, I'm I'm sorry, my screen is a little small, so I don't see everyone at once. She, she just fell down the stairs, and she goes out at night with the flashlight to see you know what the heck happened with the stairs. Yeah. And Uncle Charlie is there. And he's standing, they're both standing on the porch, and he's in the dark, and she's a little bit in the light. Yes. And when Teresa Wright, who I absolutely love, even though she doesn't have an H in her name as I do, when she goes from the light and steps into the dark to tell him, if you, you, know, if you don't leave, I, I wrote down the line, uh, you know, you know, see, uh, where's the line? Um, she, 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 she lets him know that she'll kill him. See, that's how I feel about you. Yeah. She takes the step into the darkness yeah. to face the darkness of her uncle and let him have that line. And I, I just thought it was really powerful, her going from the light into the dark. Yeah. to talk to, to Cotton and threaten him now. And and when she wears the ring and comes down the stairs, it made me think of a scene in Notorious with the key, the staircase. Yes, yeah. yes, very much. Yeah, it's a similar shot, yeah. 
Yeah. He, he like, of course, that is not an accident. Those things are very carefully oh, planned. Yeah. Teresa Wright sells it. She's so earnest. Your heart breaks for her. Um, you want her to win. She she's a great hero. She's a she's one of the great Hitchcock heroes, I think. Yeah. And who else? Somebody had something to say. Was it Gordon? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? I got clicked off for a second. Is my mic on? You're, we yes. can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, a couple of things about Teresa Wright character. Uh, I saw I saw this movie for the first time in its entirety at the Angelica last year during their Hitchcocktober series. Okay. Yeah. And when Teresa Wright did her big line, the the audience packed house applauded. She says, "You touch me, I'm going to kill you." Uh, now, one of the documentary pieces I watched on this uh, showed something very interesting. In Thornton Wilder's original script. In the very last scene, it is made very clear that she pushes Uncle Charlie off the train. She kills him. It's clearly stated in the script. But maybe the Hayes office or something wouldn't let him do that. Ah. It's more ambiguous in the finished film. He trips over her foot or something. I'm trying to remember. Right. That. It looks like it's an accident. But, um, you know, that's an interesting point. You know, what does it say about her character that she can come to that place where, you know, what else can she do? She obviously doesn't want him to keep on being there. And, um, and you know, what do you do to preserve your family? Um, so um, I think- Well, and, and yeah. back to the Our Town, he wrote that, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Thornton Wilder, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, somebody had their hand up. I think it was Jim. Yes. I was going to say that um, the whole uh, movie is about appearances and the naivete of the character changing from seeing the world as such a happy place to, you know, going into the darkness. And I wondered how much uh, the backdrop of World War II influenced uh, Alfred Hitchcock and because I he was British. He was British, and yeah. America had not gotten involved in the war until. Um, so I, like Americans still. So like Americans still thought it was like a happy place, but the British really knew it was how yeah. dark things were. Yeah, I I think that certainly that is there, but I think it reaches to the sort of darkness in your soul in a sort of different place. I mean, you know, Hitchcock's films always connect to that dark part of your soul. Um, and um, who else had something? Jim, didn't you have something to say? Are you there? Well, and I yeah. was just thinking it was not accidental at all that she pushed him off the train. I mean, it was so. Oops, we lost him. You lost your audio. Actually, it looks he like he was there. truly evil. Yeah. Yeah. I they mean, have a self preservation. Yeah. It's somewhat unclear in the film. So I guess that leaves it up to your interpretation. So, Jim, we have this note from Raquel here. It says, Can you talk about Alma Ravel and how much she had to do with Hitch's success? Oh, she was half of it. I mean, she she was behind it every film he made until you know she couldn't do it anymore but uh uh yeah she was his co-writer is pretty much his behind the scenes co-producer on just about everything he did uh i was going to say one thing about shadow which is one of the things i don't like about it is this cop out about the little story about him having the accident where he practiced skull and the you know, so you have to have a really horrible accident to become a murderer, you know, I guess. And you can't just be evil, you know, which oh. I didn't really like that. The cop out of like, it's all from, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, any other comments? Um, is anybody here who this was the first time they've seen this film? I think it was the first time I saw it, Jeff Thomas. I don't remember ever seeing it. 
So Jeff, what, what did you think having seen it for the first time? Because for the rest of us, this is kind of like a repeated experience. Well, I, I thought it was uh, uh, really great and suspenseful. Wondering uh, all the recognition scenes, like uh, when, uh, when Uncle Charlie got so mad about his picture being taken yeah. and demanding the film back, and then looking at uh, Charlie's expression, that uh, recognition that there was some, you know, just confusion about, you know, I wonder why he's so determined that he didn't want his picture taken. And, uh, but all of that kind of thing of, of uh, recognition scenes here and there, and, and finally getting to the truth. So, yeah, I thought it was uh, fascinating and, and uh, really uh, enjoy. Oh, but I, I'd also help to see it then. I, I, uh, I watched some of it over again at the beginning. I watched all the beginning over again and it helped uh, to see it after I knew what was going to happen. You know, there is, there is great joy in watching films again and again, particularly films that have so much to give to you in, in reevaluating them. Again, I, for those who were here a couple of weeks ago, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, dish on uh, Pauline Kael, who would say, you should never watch a film more than once. I totally <laughs> don't agree with that. <laughs> no. Um, there is so, great So, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, that's, the, that's the most stupid comment Pauline Kael ever made. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not the only one. <laughs> yeah. So, Lisa, the, you were talking about the uh, guy hitting, hurting his head. Did yeah. that ha was that something that happened about this time? I read that, like, after I watched the movie, I was looking at, like, facts on IMDb, and that was one of them. And I've heard of that before because I listened to, like, way too many true crime podcasts. Yeah. But I heard that there was a killer that, you know, his family was, you know, they're like, when did he change? Why was he so different? And they pointed to, like, an early head trauma in his childhood. Now, did that really make him do that? You know, personally, I don't think so. But that may have been an inspiration for the movie. Uh -huh. I was wondering if that happened around that time because Hitchcock had a habit of grabbing from the headlines. From the headline. you know? It, it yeah. seemed to say that, but I'm not sure. Yeah. It yeah. could also explain why he was so beloved at once, but then he changed so that he wasn't that yeah. person. Obviously, yeah. even though it was still in his childhood, everybody mm -hmm. loved him as a child and then something in him changed and he's right. Like, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I think there was something else that in the change, not the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just, to me, it, it just seemed like a cop out, but you know. And the scene with the, um, with the photographer, which thank you for remembering that. Um, how many of you thought when he took the picture that, um, and when he, when he handed him the roll of film that that was over with, I've, I've done enough shooting with film where you could like, <laughs> find a way to get a different role a different that you give the police or whoever is demanding the footage. And you knew, at least I knew at that moment that that photo is coming back. It's yeah. a, that, that is not, uh, was not given away. In fact, in fact, general, when that happens, it, it's like, it's there. People have that. Even, even, even so. Yes. No, cause Mr. Saunders was no dummy. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Something that Mark brought up was that Teresa Wright wasn't blonde. The Hitchcock blondes. Oh. No. Oh. Roseanne, did you have something to say? Yes. Um, regarding details like the film. Yes. The subtleties like that are handled so differently in film today. Yeah. And while I was watching it, I was laughing with all those little things that were so apparent, so obvious. Um, it was very typical of 40s, 50s movies. So what would be an example would, of that? Well, the film. You know, and, you and know, a shot pulling the film done. and swapping that. Yeah. One of the yeah. things I absolutely loved about this, and I noticed things like this a lot in film, is the musical score. And the way yeah. this one opens up is absolutely brilliant. The, the medley of classical music is worth going back to here again. The medley of classical music in the beginning is just extraordinarily overly, overly thriller style compilation of music. And it sets it up and then he gets into the small town USA which yeah. is sort of like a place where I grew up. 
And all of a sudden the music changed to this light, airy, you know, birds in the background type flute sound. That was and Dimitri was Jampkin's first film, first score for Hitchcock. And he did, oh, yeah. he did many. Yeah. many it, it was wonderful throughout. Yeah. And at the beginning scene, if you think about it, going back to the, the scenes of like poverty and the, the, the hotel room, I mean, it's just so different from the idyllic small town. I mean, some of them like, just like, say like, it, it just his image of, of urban America and New Jersey and that bridge in New Jersey. Is that the Pulaski Skyway, I think? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is like, and then there's this like dump over here. And I mean, it's just um, really sets, sets up this universe where there's evil in there. There's lurking things that are not good. And it's coming to America, coming to middle America. Well, the other end of America. Other thoughts? Uh, Gordon, you have your thumb up. Hi. Uh, well, by the way, speaking of, uh, you know, iconic little towns, I'm not little, but I'm calling in from Lubbock tonight uh, on my uh, cell phone after being stranded here by a tornado. So, but don't get me started on that. But uh, a couple of interesting things on this. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, reviews uh, I read about it said it has a lot of interesting vampire imagery, particularly about Uncle Charlie, that when you first see him, he looks like he's laying in a coffin almost. When he gets up, uh, it's almost horror, horror movie music, Dracula type music when he gets up out of the bed. Hmm. And things like him not wanting to be photographed, that Hitchcock was throwing in some vampiric nuance there. Also, I think it makes a real interesting comparison to Orson Welles' film, The Stranger which was, I think, three years later. It is also about a family member who turns out to be a psycho and it has a dinner table very similar. You know, Joseph Cotton's partner in crime, Orson Welles. And the hero in that was Edward G. Robinson. I think it has some similarities. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, other comments? Other comments. You don't sky cake that regular egg. You have to put the butter and sugar in first. See, after Hello. I, I joined late. Hi, Kelly and Teresa and Ruth and Bart. I interviewed you for the advocate uh, recently. Yes. About the Dallas Video Fest. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, came, I came late, so somebody's probably already commented on two things I wanted to bring up, which is how much do you love Hume Cronin and Henry Travers talking lightheartedly about how to murder people. It's wonderful. Murder yeah. in their midst. And also, even though I am convinced that Uncle Charlie was the merry widow murderer, doesn't it seem that Hitch leaves just a, t a shadow of a doubt, so to speak, about that, that it could have been the guy the cops were chasing in the East? I don't know. I, I, I kind of think he did it. I mean, it, you can't listen to that speech at the dinner table and think that he's not capable about that. And there I'm, may have been a shadow of a doubt near the beginning of the film, but I the think. Beginning. Right. Yeah. When he holds his hands like this, you know, it's like, it's pretty clear that uh, he is not yeah. innocent. But I maybe mean, he killed somebody, but there also was another killer on the loose. The oh, the ring to me is kind of a dead giveaway, though. Well, like, yeah, you know. yeah. Like I said, I'm convinced, but I think I don't know. To me, um, I I thought they left a little bit of room for discussion there when, uh, you know, like when he says to young Charlie, "You don't like the inscription in a ring someone gives you," and so forth. That you know that she hasn't got proof. Yeah, the evidence was circumstantial, I feel, at the end still. But I pretty strong. I have to say, Ruth. But I think I he did, love, yeah. <laughs> I love the shadow on your image there. In case you don't see that, check that out. Because this is shadow of a doubt. Shadow of a doubt. <laughs> Excellent, Ruth. So Ruth gets so a gold star for best image on the box today. No. So I have to say, I initially thought there could have been somebody else. 
I'm a huge Joseph Cotton fan. I'd hate to think of him as a killer. <laughs> but oh, at no, the end, that was cool. At the end, when he grabs her and, and you know they're on the train and they're struggling, and I'm like, "That's your niece. That's your namesake. Ah, you're the killer." Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sometimes you have to come to the realization that there is evil in some people's soul, even if you want to like them. Yes. Yes, uh -huh. and I did really want to believe that it could have been someone else, that it was a mistaken identity, that, you know, some people are quirky, you know, but you're right, the ring gave it away, the, the being trapped in the garage, yeah. you yeah. know, but I did like the banter with Hume Crowen and the whole murder thing, that was just like, <laughs> really, I, um, what a hobby. You know, yeah, so you know, but it's one of my favorite movies. It's one of my absolute favorites. It's always a good one to see, and I, I and I love that YouTube has it for free. <laughs> yeah. I wonder. I wonder if that was the best name for the movie. I read uh, somewhere that it was uh, supposed to just be the name until they came up with a better one. But uh, great. I don't so, know. Shadow of a doubt. Would, I don't know. What would you want to call it? I don't know. I guess that's why they didn't change it. I don't know what to call it. The trouble with Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be um, I, I think it works beautifully. And also in the movie is just so perfectly cast down to the smallest part. You know, yeah. the F operator, the family. Wasn't that like originally called Uncle Charlie or something like that? Wasn't that the working title, maybe? I think I think it might have been. Oh. You know, I think I remember hearing that now that you mentioned that. Yeah. I think I do remember hearing that. No, and I, I, I would agree there might be a shadow of a doubt were it not for the incident with the steps and the incident in the garage. I mean, yeah. I think he revealed himself very clearly. Yeah. And, and, and the scene at the dinner table. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. the, the scene at the dinner yeah. table. You yeah. just don't see in films somebody unloading like that and putting out their worldview in such an articulate manner. I mean, it's just kind of insane. Can someone here please talk about Louise, the waitress at the CD bar, the lovely Janet Shaw? Can I hear anybody's thoughts about her? I thought she was terrific in the part, and she reminds me of waitresses I've had at CD bars. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been to CD bars? Oh, yeah. <laughs> But the, the moment in that that I think is, is interesting is that these two knew each other. They come from different worlds. It also yeah. gives you the sense that within this world of Santa Rosa, there's maybe a different world in Santa Rosa that Charlie has never experienced. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and there are people who actually like work for a living other than in a bank. And I think that it just gives you a glimpse of something that's not the library or something that's not a nice house or the, the club that they all like talk about. And, and I think that there's this under, and, and notice that Charlie is not very nice to her and not, doesn't Bobby. respond, you right. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like they were in school together, but they clearly have a different sides of the right. number of tracks. Yeah, and and Charlie's I, led a very privileged life and shelter. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's that scene just like shows that in a very art, you know, very quick way, you really get a different sense of her worldview and the limitations on her worldview. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that the waitress noticed the, the ring and talked about it being um, so lovely and she, she knew good jewelry when she saw it. I thought that was interesting. And I just die for a ring like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, <laughs> get to know Uncle Charlie. <laughs> And you'll have your opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the longing that she had, you know, because she was almost embarrassed by seeing uh, Charlie also. Yeah. She, you know, it, it wasn't how she would want to be remembered, you know, and so you kind of felt her, God, I don't want to be here right now, you know, kind of feeling like, what's she thinking about me? Does she still think I'm that same girl, of, you know, from the other side of the tracks? Mm -hmm. That kind of deal. You, you know, she felt it too, even though, um, Charlie, who was more aloof and trying to, you know, hold herself, um, I kind of felt like, shame on you, Charlie. You can't be gracious even after all this time, you know, when you, you portray yourself as being such a, a lovely young lady, you know, and you can't be gracious enough at, at this point. 
she just felt like she didn't, you, you almost tell that she didn't even want to sit on the chair, you know, in that moment of, I've never been in here. Yes. You know, kind I mean, of it was thing. clear. I think it was more about the place than the, than her, than the girl. Yeah, you know, but. Uh, trying to kill me. Yeah. I, I, I think she was nervous about being in a bar. In the seedy bar. In the seedy bar. And it what as as a seedy bar, it's not a very seedy bar. <laughs> I mean, in other Hollywood films, there would be real seedy bars. But for hey, it wasn't reason, the frolic room, Teresa. <laughs> but it was a it was a good it was a good place for him to tell her that she had never seen how dark the world is. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in some ways I can relate to that because when I was, you know, a lot younger. You know, I would have never gone into a bar by myself. We were always in a group together, you know, and we always are trying to go somewhere upscale. And then and someone said one time, you know, let's go to this blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, eh, you, you know, you're not supposed to go there. You know, I'm a girl from Pasadena. You know, I don't do those kind of things. But now you couldn't get me out of one. And, and what if when you went into one of those things, you saw somebody you knew from high school? Or worse yet, been suppose you were the waitress. And I wouldn't have been somebody you knew from high school. That would be I wouldn't have been. <laughs> no, I would have been the girl seeing somebody else and going, "Oh, that's so and so," <laughs> because I, that I, that's kind of how the background was from where I grew up. I mean, you know, there were those kids that were on that side of town, and you know, and, and we would lurk over there, but we would never, you know, <laughs> admit it loudly. Does anyone have any idea how old these um, these young women were? Because uh, they looked like they were thirty, but I'm sure they were supposed <laughs> yeah. to be younger. Well, well, think, at what point? Forty-one. Teresa Wright was twenty-three years old. But at one point, somebody said they were sixteen or eighteen. I thought they were post-college. They didn't. Isn't that right? I thought they talked about like I university. They were post high school, but I don't think they went oh. to college. Yeah, I okay. thought post high they school. They were post high school. Easily could have been like in junior college. Yeah. yeah. So, she had uh, talked about the waitress having been in her class. I got the impression at high school. You okay. know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Charlie's father talks about her being the smartest girl in her graduating class, which yeah. took yeah. to be high school. Yeah, I don't think she was a college graduate at that point. I don't think, I, I don't know what she was supposed to be doing in the world. I mean, well, she was preparing for marriage. Waiting for a husband. She was yeah. baking, she was baking and cooking with her mom and running the errands and preparing to be a proper wife of a Santa Rosa banker or detective. <laughs> well, at, 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 the, at the beginning of the film, she was just whining and complaining. Right. That, about how boring her life is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indeed. So, so let me ask you this as a, as a kind of wrap up question. Um, what is, what does this film have to say to us now that it didn't say to us when it was made? Oh, good question. Hmm. Definitely something about Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that it says anything about Trump unless you think that uh, Uncle Charlie is Trump. And I, it, I, I think that that's... Trump was more charming than Trump. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Will you trust strangers to their daughters? <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, there's a sense of, you know, security. Is our life secure? You know, and we are in this moment when life is not normal. I mean, yeah. that what that Santa Rosa does that did that ever really exist, and does that exist now someplace? That's a yeah. That was a whole different world there. So it's like you know, you know, well, are there I like it in Santa? Like well, you know, Santa Rosa would be like equivalent to like you know a Napa. Or um, if you guys remember Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the town that, um, that was filmed in is Sierra Madre. Mm -hmm. And Sierra Madre still looks like that. The town square still is that footprint of uh, that, that famous scene of them running out of town. Um, and, and, you know, in small towns, you have people who just stay. You know, some people leave, but, you know, some people stay. Mm -hmm. I can so see that a very conservative, you know, town, still being very similar to, to Santa Rosa. Um, 
Santa Rosa is probably still like that <laughs> to a certain extent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I thought it was weird the way she was saying how her family was going to pieces. And then she explained because they were doing nothing. And, uh, and it was just so boring um, that, that normally if something's going to pieces, I, I think it would be more like it was later. But, uh, but anyway, they, yeah, she got the excitement she wanted. Hey, you know what? Be careful yeah. what you wish for. In a more modern film where you're where you're in a small town like that, something like Places in the Heart, you know, uh, I mean that's that's not a really good town, you know. I mean, as far as the things that happen there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's you know they got the racial stuff and the, and, the, and the sheriff being shot and the you know. Right. So there, there is that sense that small town America is not pure and good. That there is yeah. you know, that lurks around there. Um, and I think that's a very, uh, a very different thing. Um, and Gordon Smith says, like growing up in Lubbock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, Lubbock did give us Buddy Holly, so it can't be 100% bad. Yes. <laughs> well, guys, um, Jim, do you have any closing thoughts you want to say? Uh, watch more Hitchcock. Well, Yay! Yeah. Yes. And, and so what, what is... If you enjoyed this, which I think everybody here thoroughly enjoyed this, what would you strongly recommend everybody watch as their next Hitchcock film to watch? Oh, to uh, Catch a Thief. Uh, Rebecca. Strangers on a Train, if you haven't seen it. Strangers on a Train. Yeah. yeah. Rear Window. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, like, I like Rebecca. I, I, I like Rebecca. I like Strangers on a Train. Yeah. I, I would have a the thing with Rebecca is you always have that is is it a Selznick is it a Hitchcock is it a Selznick is it a Hitchcock you know that's that whole thing and, you know no, so. Psycho is always good um, yeah you know, I saw the birds recently and really loved that a lot more than when I saw yeah. it probably I mean I, I think that's incredibly I, I think that was his last really great film yeah and then there's his 30s films too like um, um, the, the British film, events. yeah, the British thirty and um, yeah. Yeah. the Lady oh, Vanishes yeah. are fantastic. Lady Vanishes, oh, that's great. Thirty nine oh, steps. Yes, yeah, since those have gone back into copyright, they've uh, they've remastered them, and you can get some really beautiful copies of them now. So, or oh, Young and Young and Innocent with Nova yes. Pilbeam. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. We've got an interesting trouble with Harry story. Mm -hmm. Interesting couple of what stories? Trouble with Harry. The oh, Trouble with Harry's is phenomenal. I love that. Yeah. That is such a great, it's shot beautifully. I love everything about it. You well, should have Mark do Trouble with Harry so he can tell the story. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I like the, the man who knew too much comparing both versions. Both versions. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, um, we've come to 8.30 and I try to make these only one hour, but uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Next week, uh, we'll have Chris Wagner with us, and we'll be showing the uh, watch the Miles Davis documentary that's on Netflix, I think. I'm almost sure it's on Netflix. Um, and I will uh, send you a link if you get our newsletter at go to videofest.org, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll have information on uh, next week's film. If you have other suggestions of films or guest hosts that you would like, uh, please send me an email, uh, bard at videofest.org, or you can uh, just put something down here. We're keeping a list and we'll just keep doing this as long as people keep coming to, uh, to see it. And um, I just think it's really um, a lot of fun to, uh, to watch these films. Jim, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your insight. And thanks so much for all you do in uh, promoting classic films and uh, having people over to see them. You are like a mensch and it's wonderful to have you in our community. So we really, really appreciate you um, for many, many, many years. You've taught us so much. So with that guys, um, We'll see you uh, see you next week, Thursday night, 7.30 Central Time. <laughs> I, I'm glad I got to join. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah. Ruth, so good to see week. everyone. And Ruth, I want to see what you do with the light next week. 
let's see what we watch. <laughs> Bye right. everyone. Bye. 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 It was great. Thank you. Steven. Hello, Steven. <laughs> it's so good to see um, Elizabeth. It's good to see you. Um, I've seen your name, but I've not met you in real in the real time. Yes, that's here. I am. Yeah. This is the last part. This is the third time I've been here. I thought it was at seven Eastern time. Then I thought it was at seven thirty Eastern time. So the three times I joined up with him. Oh. Yes. And he had well, on a different shirt each time. I each only time. two times. Yeah. Only two times. Well, Bart, Bart, I really like I like Bart's background with all the film. Yeah. So do you want to see what my real background is? Yes, Bart. Okay. Hold on, I'll show you what, th th there's a reason why I have a virtual background. Of course, it's a total <laughs> mess. <here. laughs> it's like, and, and if you looked at the other direction, you would probably see 2000 VHS tapes, hi eight tapes, DVDs, you know, every possible medium known to man. Uh, they're all here, but you know. That's well, if I turned this around, you'd see all the boxes packed because I'm moving. <laughs> so. how, how soon, Ruth? Um, uh, I, um, I take a load over tomorrow, and then I get my keys on Sunday. Yay! Yes. Yes. Thank you. yes. So, woo! -hoo. And I'll Yay. only be uh, I'll be ten blocks from the water, so I'll be much happier. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Close up to the bar. Here. I'm Ooh, so happy. Bar. What? Yeah, very close. Okay. <laughs> Doubling distance. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Bart. Thank Thanks, you Bart. All. Nice to meet yeah, you. Thanks a lot. Bart, I, put my, I put my email in the in the chat, Bart, so you can include me on your email list. Oh, okay. There it is. I see it right there. Okay. And, and I, I did mine too. Oh, I, I got it. Already, I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to do this and copy it, and I'll get you. So the the the, the newsletter comes out every Monday. Okay. And uh, it's sometimes entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> well, as everyone, as Kelly and, and Teresa and, and Trudy will tell you, I'm a I'm a huge fan. So I, I just I love being with my people. Yes. Vir virtual hug. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Your hair looks great, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's a, it's a, I, I, I think my hairdresser can start taking appointments next week so I can get my do back and take the, and take the, the caterpillars off my eyebrows. But, yeah, but you I, look fine I realize today I need to get my hair cut. <laughs> I, I'm getting, my, my bangs are in, you know, I'm going to look like Cousin It pretty soon. <laughs> Steven, are you having no, a hard time keeping your hair out of your eyes? From the TV show or for the movie? Um, I haven't seen the movies. I go back to the 60s TV show. Yeah, which was one of my favorite TV shows of any. Oh, yeah. It definitely, hey, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm uh, pasting in everybody's uh, email address. So that's why okay, I'm great. only halfway paid. Hey, Bart, this is Steve Frain. I uh, joined late there, uh, but I'll definitely be back next week. Oh, great. Thank and. You. I just have a quick question for everybody. Uh, you were talking about um, other Hitchcock movies, and I, I haven't seen them all, but I've probably seen about maybe 25 or 30. And uh, one that I really like that's a little bit obscure is, um, oh boy, the Charles Lawton one. Uh, what is, oh, doggone, I'm, I'm blanking on the name um, with Maureen O'Hara. Jamaica Inn. Jamaica Inn, oh, that's right. Yes. I was, yeah. Wonder, do, oh yeah, uh, it's got a pretty low rating on IMDb, and I I, I really liked it myself. I'm just curious, yeah. does anyone else uh, it, does anyone else see the the low rating on that and agree with that, or am I? I it must be because they're they're I, I actually low have not seen that film. I've only no. seen it once a, a few years ago, but I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's not yeah. to me up with his top work, but right even you know middling Hitchcock is. Better than most people's films, <laughs> right? So okay. I'm not I'm not wild about it, um, yeah. and I kind of always am in and out when I'm trying to watch it. I need to just do a hard sit down and go, you know, start to finish. But 
it, it, it didn't yeah. capture me and it hasn't, but I, I love I guess, Maureen O'Hara. I guess I'm alone on that one though, cause uh, I really like yeah. it. But there's a, I'm, I'm real, not, real happy about uh, the, the Cohen group has put out a nice DVD of it. It's re in real good condition. So I, huh. I'm really thrilled with all the, the DVDs they put out. Yeah, I think that's it. They sponsored good. a screening, I think, to kick it off. I saw it in, you know, an actual theater where it's easier to pay attention than mm -hmm. it is on TV unless right. you're, you know, my, my, my favorite movies, yes, I can pay attention on TV, but something that's new to me. It's it's better in a theater for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I actually saw Shadow of a Doubt on the big screen at the Vista in Hollywood a year, two years ago today. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Which is really funny. It was like this is really funny. That's wow. Yeah, and it came up on my Facebook. I'm like, okay, I'll see it again. <laughs> Who is Teresa Wright on the big screen? I find her. So how 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 is it seeing her? It is, it's epic on the big screen. It really is. It's, it's lovely, you know, because you feel like you're walking the streets with them on a, you know, it, you, you really feel like you're around the dinner table. It's a great experience to me to watch that on the big screen. It really, and, and I've seen it, you know, like all of us, we've all seen it for years on our televisions, but seriously, on the big screen, it was just luscious. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, and the train scene was then even more epic. Cause you're like, yeah. mm. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. So that's definitely one that needs to be on the big screen. I, I jump every single time I see it that, the, um, the terrain scene. I mean, as if though I haven't seen it before. And I can imagine uh, on the big screen, you know, in a theater. Oh my yeah. God. It's, it's just really shocking every time. It's so shocking when you see that he actually really is going to try to kill her. Yeah. Uh, he made two attempts, and this time I'm taking you out. It's, it's, I'm going to put myself in 1943. 41, 42, how that must have looked that your uncle really is doing this. You know, I, I, have, I have to applaud him. He, he subverts everything. He'll subvert the family. He'll subvert religion. He'll subvert the law. He's, he's an amazing director. But like Stranger from the Train, you know, he, 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 you know, he strangles, has a woman strangled who's pregnant. And we see it. We see it. We yes. see it. Yeah. In the glass. I mean, yes. He's, he's, he's great. Yes. At TCM, at the film festival, when they showed Strangers on a Train, I heard a line that I have never heard before, even after seeing the movie, I don't know how many times when he, he finally tells Ruth Roman about Bruno, and she, she asks him, like, you know, did you do this? Did you plan this? And the whole audience gasped when she's accusing him. And, you know, I'm, I'm hearing things a little bit better when I see him on the big screen. So that's why I'm wondering about Teresa Wright and, and Joseph Cotton, does her earnestness come out? Does his yes. come out so yes. big? Yes. And then when, when he gets hit by the, when, you know, he falls out, you're like, <gasps> you're like oh my God. <laughs> and then the Mary Widow Waltz comes in. Yes. <laughs> Great. Wow. And the ending of that film makes me think of the ending of my favorite film, Vertigo. Which is like, are they are they laughing a little bit? Like, hey, that's the way the world is mixed up. Like your uncle Charlie, you know, it's a little sardonic, a little of that Hitchcock macabre sense of humor to me. I don't know if anybody else picks that up, but you know. And then they, they she's just sort of like, and then we, you know, we fade out and show the credits. Um, and, I, and I almost wish there was more, you know, like after she got off the train, what did she say to her mother? Who that I was know, her right? brother? Yeah, oh, like, yeah. mom. Not Uncle Charlie, you know. Mom. But you know what? I, 
hope of the double, you know, the double, the duality. But just think about this. Just think about when Teresa Wright's character is born, the mother is, is so in love with her brother, her favorite brother, that she names her first after her brother. And something, you know, something's up. Something's up. Well, she was a very attentive sister in, in, in that he, obviously he was younger and she they doted on him. Nobody likes their little brother. Nobody likes their little brother. But she almost, you know, had like, it was like she had a, a crush on him or something. She she just was so enamored of him and he was just so, and he made that. And I'm like, really? Oh. <laughs> what up here? All righty then. There's a couple of times when the, the Teresa Wright character seemed like she had a major crush on him and it was kind of like, mm, on your uncle? <laughs> yeah. Well, he looks like Joseph Cotton. Well, right, right, okay. <laughs> oh, there's, but, but yeah, there's, there's definitely, there's more than uncle and niece going on there. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there's a bit more. It, it will, because she even thinks that she wants to send him a telegram. Well, yeah. I've never thought to call my uncle up just to see if you can come over to make me happy. Oh, from, from across the country. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's set up that he's so busy. It's set up that he is unavailable, unattainable. Yeah. He's, he's, he's all the way up here. In a row. So, you know, it, he's he's an unattainable thing that you keep trying to reach for. And and he lives a much more exciting life. Because yeah. I think the key is Santa Rosa is boring. Yeah. Well, it's boring, it's predictable, and I think that's the her she just wants some excitement. She just didn't realize that excitement may not always be great. Right. Well she's so funny because when she tells her father, oh, it's boring, we should do something for mother, he recognizes she's a kid. What would you like to do for mom? I don't know. I don't know. And, and she goes back to lay down. So she doesn't have anything formulated. She doesn't have any plans, anything concrete. Just, I'm bored and, ugh, we've got to do something to spice this up. And so Uncle Charlie is going to be the spice. Yeah. yeah. Uncle Charlie is crazy. <laughs> He's crazy. Yeah. Maybe, they sh maybe they should have called the movie Beyond a Shadow of a Doubt. I don't know. I, I would have liked that better. Mm -hmm. but anyway. Or maybe that should have been the sequel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can we have a sequel? Beyond a Shadow of a Doubt. <laughs> Can we break right. it back? Right. 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 A Dana right. Andrews movie, Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. Oh, Andrews and Joan Fontaine. Okay. So in the in the sequel, oh. um, Charlie like it gets inhabited by Uncle Charlie's like spirit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. or, or no, she well, and her right. husband find out there's another Mary Widow. Yeah, and they go Ooh. after him together as a detective couple. We gotta leave. Oh, oh, all right. Oh, okay, all right. I don't want Teresa Wright killing anybody. I, I no, can't. I can't have her killing anybody. Oh no, no, no. no. <laughs> no. But um, Nick and Nick and Nora, but a little more serious. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not so many martinis. <laughs> not so many martinis. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it'll work without the martinis. But Ryan, oh, she loved Ryan. <laughs> at TCM's uh, film festival, at one one year at the after party, I was talking to this young man. I don't know how we got on Teresa Wright. Maybe I brought it up, maybe he did. I don't quite remember. But I, I, I'll never forget the way this young man said, how can, and so gentle he said it, and so poignant he said it. He said, how can you not love Teresa Wright? I almost burst out in tears right there at the party. Just the, the, the loving way he said, he had to be a good 40 years younger than me. How he knows to write, I don't know. But the way he said it always struck me, you know. Yeah, she's so nice. 
Those uh, TCM film festivals are great. I've been to all of them except one. Oh, we oh, wow. have. Who said that? You, Stephen? Jeff Thomas. Oh, yeah, that's Jeff yeah. Thomas. Yeah, I've been to all of them except one uh, in Hollywood. Yeah. Well, Jeff, um, are you a member of my T going to TCM Facebook group? Oh, uh, no. Are you on Facebook? Uh, I'm not sure, but I could be. Uh, okay, well, if you're not <laughs> I've never heard anybody say that. <laughs> well, they'll let me on. I, I think I have an account, but I. I've never really used it. Well, well, uh, well, hardly. I used it once, I guess. Well, if you were on it and you 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 were in this group, you would want to be on Facebook because Teresa and Trudy and Ruth and I guess the other ones are gone. Um, and Mark and I are all on that, and we talk like this all the time. We just just not in. Person. Oh, okay. How would I find it on Facebook? 